Hello, this is Philip welcoming you to the 2051st edition of the Enfield Talking newspaper. Our dateline this week is the 2nd of June 2016. And this week I am your reader because we've had a problem with the recording which meant that the wonderful recording made by Evan, by Stephanie, Colin, Sally and recorded by Robin uh, earlier tonight uh, hasn't gone quite according to plan. So I'm sorry about that and that you've just got me for the next 60 minutes talking to you, I'm afraid. Our title music is Country Rock Polka, composed by Pat Prilly, Fernand Bouillon, Harry Breuer, and performed by Jean-Jacques Perry, and is used with his kind permission. Our local stories come from our local newspapers, the Enfield Gazette and Advertiser, and the Enfield Independent, and are their copyright. The event's information has been collated by us from other sources. The local news headlines this week include Splash! Meridian Water Deal will create thousands of new homes and jobs and school placement fiasco. Before the news, we have uh, one or two special news items and notices. First, the sunrise and sunset times for the week ahead, starting tomorrow, the 3rd of June. Sunrise will be at 0447 hours, and sunset will be at 2111 hours. Don't forget that our AGM takes place on Wednesday, the 8th of June, and that will be held at St Andrew's Church Hall, Silver Street, Enfield Town. There's lots of parking available, so um, easy for taxis to get in. Uh, if you need help with transport, then do call Diane de Jersey on 020 8805 6578, and we'll be able to sort something out for you. Our special guest speaker this year is Charles Carroll, who's a ra- Radio 4 newsreader. He'll be talking to us about his job and uh, giving our readers some tips of the trade. So do get in touch if you need help with transport to the AGM on Wednesday. We'd love to see as many listeners there as possible to give us feedback about what we've been doing over the past year. And do get in touch with us to share your news and special announcements too, because we love to hear from you. If you have any comments about the Enfield Talking newspaper, you can phone Diane de Jersey, who's our listener's representative, and her number is 020 8805 6578. And now, on to the first item of local news. School placement fiasco. A mother whose son was only offered a place at a school nearly 45 minutes away says she feels messed around. Dawn McCarney of Willow Road, Enfield, now fears four-year-old Dylan will not be able to start in reception with his friends in September and is considering homeschooling him. The 32-year-old and her husband, electrician Himat, wanted him to go to the Lavender School where he is currently in nursery, as, he's, as he had been settling in well. But despite applying on time and putting down six choices close to their house, he was only offered a place at Suffolk Primary School, which is a 45-minute walk or a half-hour drive away. Miss McCarney said, It's a very sad and uncertain time for us, and it's getting worse. It is heartbreaking to think he won't be in school with the friends he's made at nursery, as we wanted him to settle in somewhere first. We're disappointed as we had been to see all the schools in the area and put down the ones we thought would suit him. It's unfair and silly because he's not got a place at a school close by. I don't have access to a car every day as my husband uses it sometimes, and walking him to school for 45 minutes isn't really feasible. We want a school we can walk to. We applied for those schools because they fit in with our family life, and it's where I feel he would thrive the most. They declined the place at Suffolk Primary School in the hope something closer and more convenient would become available. Dylan is now currently 14th on the waiting list for Lavender School and 12th for Worcester School, his second choice, as those who applied late but live closer get priority. She has tried to contact councillors but has had no help and says the admissions team at Enfield Council have not been able to offer any advice. Miss McCarney, who's also mother to one-year-old Holly, added, I feel angry that there's no one to talk to from admissions. There's nobody to fight our corner. It's very stressful. Education is so important. He'll be there for the next seven years of his life. Instead, they have given me any old school, but I'm not taking just anything. I worry he won't have any schools to go to in September. That makes me feel sad. We feel quite messed around. This year, in Enfield, there were 4,508, a record number of applications, and 4,399 were offered their first choice. Miss McCarney said the issue is oversubscription. There are too many children for the amount of schools there are. It's silly children can go above you, even if they didn't apply on time. I'm sorry, it is silly children can go above you even if they didn't apply on time, but I think that's a nationwide thing. The council have been contacted for comment. 
And our next main story, splashing Meridian Water Deal, will create thousands of new homes and jobs. A deal has been clinched for a massive jobs and homes bonanza for the borough. More than 16,000 new jobs and 10,000 homes will be created as part of the regeneration of a former waterfront industrial site on 65 acres of land in Edmonton. Enfield Council has appointed Barrett London as its preferred developer on Friday for the £3.5 billion Meridian Water Project, one of the largest in the UK. Light industry developer Segro has also been appointed and acquired 10 acres of the site for new warehouses and industrial units. In addition to the new homes, the development will include improved road and rail links, a new railway station, a school, community facilities and shops, all around a beautiful waterfront setting. As a housing zone declared by the government, the removal of certain planning constraints will accelerate construction. A total of 10,000 of the 16,000 new jobs will be in construction over the 20-year lifespan of the project. With the significant investment in Meridian Water is expected to attract, together with the improved transport links between North London and the Lee Valley Corridor, it has been estimated it could add an extra £3 billion to the UK economy by 2036. Speaking after the formal announcement of the Council's preferred developer, Councillor Ahmed Oinkner, Cabinet Member for Housing and Regeneration, said, Now we can start getting boots on the ground and proceed with this transformational project for Edmonton and the wider area, and create a truly world-class development which will improve the quality of life for tens of thousands of people. Meridian Water will play a huge part in helping to ease the housing crisis in London and will provide a fantastic quality accommodation for thousands of families. Alan Sitkin, Cabinet Member for Economic Regeneration and Business, added, The growth and prosperity Meridian Water will create will give our residents, some of whom live in the most deprived parts of London, an unparalleled opportunity to benefit from the jobs and training opportunities we will be creating. And more about new housing development now. Council praises developers' plan for 412 homes. A planning application for over 400 new homes has been praised by Enfield Council. Developers Countryside have submitted the plans to be built on Avenue Road in Southgate to replace the new Avenue estate with the existing blocks on Coverack Close, Beardo Grove, Oakwood Lodge and Shepcott House demolished to make way for it. The £140 million redevelopment would increase the number of homes from 171 to 412, with plans for a mix of apartments, maisonettes and houses, and also include a community centre and preschool nursery. Richard Cherry, the chief executive of Countryside Properties, said, We've worked closely with the council and local community to design a scheme that not only significantly increases the number of homes, but also creates a much improved environment for residents and the wider community, and we look forward to moving ahead with the delivery of new housing. Councillor Ahmed Oinkner said, This development not only introduces many additional homes, but it also includes features that will make it a much more enjoyable place to live in. Playground refurbishments almost completed. Enfield Council has said major playground renovations ahead of the summer holidays are almost complete. The £292,000 programme will see four of the borough's parks, Lee Road Open Space, Ponders End Park, Tatton Park and Delhi Gardens, get facelifts and receive modernised play equipment and new entrances to make them more accessible for disabled children and their families. Work is nearly done at Ponders End, where the park underwent a £1 million facelift three years ago, and work is finished at Lee Road. Cabinet Member for the Environment, Councillor Daniel Anderson, said that all four parks will be done before the start of the school holidays. Horror at removal of speed camera on Boy Racer Road. People have been left horrified after a speed camera was removed from a road plagued by speeding and boy racers. TfL have decided to remove the camera from the A10 Great Cambridge Road in Enfield, despite regular complaints of people driving irresponsibly. Councillors have written to the New London Mayor Sadiq Khan in an attempt to persuade him to change TfL's mind. The letter, co-written by Chase Ward councillors Nick Dines and Peter Fallard, says the problem is particularly bad on Sunday evenings, with some driving dangerously fast, risking lives and causing a lot of noise. The letter says this has long been a problem and, recently, by using a cross-party approach and encouraging targeted enforcement, a difference was was made. 
Unfortunately, the summer months historically have seen an increase in people gathering at various locations around the A10, and recent weeks have seen large numbers congregating. We are therefore horrified to learn, as part of a review, Transport for London has decided to remove the speed camera on the A10. Incredibly, we've been told that there are no plans to replace it, meaning for a two-mile stretch of the road, there is now no restraint on speeding. We urge you to ask officers at TfL to reconsider their stance and put the speed camera back. Councillor Dines and Fallot also asked Mr Khan for more traffic police on the A10 before a serious accident occurs. On May the 8th, the A10 was shut northbound for the entire evening after an accident involving a car and a motorbike, with residents taking to Facebook to say it was inevitable given the speed cameras on the road. Chris Malloy said, I don't even have the doors open, just the window locked slightly ajar. Plus, I'm not that close to the A10, but I can hear them. It's definitely got worse since the cameras went. They just race up and down. I don't understand why there's such a big deal about cost to maintain when these cameras are supposed to be cash cows. Transport for London have been contacted for comment. And from roads to cycling. Cycle Plan Challenge. Campaigners have stepped up their fight against a cycle route on a busy road and are ready for a court showdown. Save Our Green Lanes has applied for a judicial review of Enfield Council's A105 Cycle Enfield Scheme from Palmer's Green Library to Enfield Town. The group decided to act following the release of council documents that campaigners show negative impacts on parking, the viability on businesses, air quality, congestion and bus journey times, as well as safety. Spokesman Costas Georgiou said the council has still not addressed valid concerns. The cycle lanes are bad news for our local community. We have been left with no option but to apply for a judicial review proceedings in the High Court. We served the court papers on Enfield Council on Friday. Campaigners say parking would be lost along much of the route. They also say buses would stop in the middle of the road rather than in laybys and passengers would have to cross cycle lanes when they get on and off. Many businesses do not have rear access and claim the changes would mean they would not be able to function without deliveries from the front or customers being able to collect takeaway food. Mr Georgiou, who also chairs the Green Lanes Business Association, said concerns about the cycle lane scheme are making businesses think twice about opening in Palmer's Green. We've had two empty units in 2013. We now have 12. The A105 Green Lanes to London Road scheme is part of a wider £42 million investment in cycling in London. The cycle lane plans also include Enfield Town, Southbury Road and Hartford Road. A council spokesman said the council has just received notification that a judicial review has been issued. The council does not consider it appropriate to comment as the matter is before the courts. A judicial review is a legal challenge to the way a decision has been made. The hearing will not consider the rights and wrongs of the decision, but whether the right procedure was followed. Justin Saddlesaw at Millie Mini Holland Plan. And there's a picture with this article, uh, which says, Taking a stand, Justin Mason is riding to Bristol to raise funds for the High Court challenge to the proposed cycle Enfield scheme. A cyclist is to ride from Enfield to Bristol in a bid to halt the scheme for protected cycle routes on the borough's main roads. Justin Mason of Rally Road Enfield has set up an online Just Giving page to raise cash to fund a High Court challenge to overturn Enfield's council's plans. Despite regularly commuting to work in central London by bike, the 46-year-old opposes the Cycle Enfield scheme, which will see one-way Cecil Street in Enfield Town closed close to where he lives, become two-way, with Church Street, which runs parallel to it, reserved for bikes and buses. He said that the changes will see pollution and noise levels shoot up in the residential streets around his home, making the streets less safe for him and his children. I love being on a bike, he said, but I can't accept the council's proposals as they're a threat to the welfare and health of all of us who live in the vicinity. For the council to bulldoze this through is not right and must be resisted strongly, he added. He's been criticised by the Better Streets for Enfield Facebook group who accuse him of putting self-interest above others. But Mr Mason hit back, reiterating his main concern over the volume of traffic which would be displaced from Church Street to Cecil Road and the surrounding residential side streets, causing pollution and making it significantly more unsafe for adults and children when crossing them. 
and his Just Giving page can be found uh, uh, on uh, crowdfunding.justgiving.com forward slash sponsor Justin for Enfield. And another man on his bike now, BMW dealer gets on his bike in charity appeal bid. The owner of a car dealership has traded in his usual drive to work for a bike in order to raise money for charity. Richard Ennis, the head of business at Stephen James BMW dealership in Enfield, swapped his BMW i8 for a cargo bike and will be cycling home from in Winchmore Hill to his work on Lincoln Road each day for a week to raise money for the Nightingale Cancer Support Centre. Mr Ennis said the last time he was on a bike was nine years ago, but he agreed to do it because he's become increasingly frustrated with traffic on his car journey to work, as well as to raise money for the dealership's chosen charity for the year. Lisa Baker, fundraising manager for the Nightingale, said, We get no statutory funding and have to rely totally on the local community to help us raise not only much-needed funds, but to enable us to provide our services free of charge to the people of Enfield. Having organisations like Stephen James supporting us and fundraising for us is essential to our survival. And there's a nice picture of Stephen on uh, his cargo bike, which is sort of a bike with this sort of pram-looking uh, type thing in front of it on two wheels. Um, and he's s- sitting on it uh, next to his rather swanky BMW car with its sort of two doors uh, sticking up in the air. Now, some other news. Away from the roads. The best possible taste. Children at an Enfield primary school tucked into dinner to celebrate the launch of a new kitchen. The team of staff at Galliard Primary School cooked up lunches for 400 pupils every day. The new £600,000 kitchen at the school in Galliard Road, Edmonton, was completed in January as part of Enfield Council's plans to provide modern facilities for cooking. The makeover included new appliances, cooking equipment and storage, and the dining room was also spruced up. Good, healthy school food is a key priority, explained Ifa Rohan, the Cabinet Member for Education, Children's Services and Child Protection. School kitchens are a high priority, she said. They improve our schools, and with a big demand for hot, tasty, nutritional meals, we know this is a huge contributing factor in children's learning. For some children, it's their only meal of the day. The school's head teacher, Penny Sullivan, said children enjoy their lunch times and have great fun choosing appetising meals and learning social skills having lunch together. We also encourage children to learn about the food they're eating, where it comes from, how it is grown and what it is good and why it is good for them. Dishes include honey and soy salmon, tangy fennel and dill coleslaw and carrot and beetroot cake. School dinners took a leading place on the menu in 2005 when TV chef Jamie Oliver campaigned about improving lunches offered to pupils across the country. Strict nutritional rules were introduced in primary schools in 2008. Enfield Catering Services provide 20,000 meals for pupils across the borough every day. Enfield was rated fifth out of 32 boroughs last autumn uh, in the Good Good Food for London table results. It's also picked up the Food for Life catering mark, serving ethically sourced fresh food on site and the Marine Stewardship Council accreditation for using sustainable fish. It's been recognised for using free-range eggs and dairy goods from animals which have access to pasture. Ms Orhan said, sourcing quality ingredients, our cooks provide carefully balanced meals and have a string of industry recognition awards to show for it. And talking of uh, organic growing, uh, the next story is What a Way to Grow. And there's a photo of uh, Enfield in Bloom coordinator Dennis Lushy, Mayor of Enfield Bernadette Lepage, and Adam Davison, Head of Community Relations at Tottenham Hotspur, Hotspur, walking through rather a nice lush uh, landscape. And here's the story. It's about improving the look of the area through horticulture says Lifetime Gardener Dennis Lushy, on how Enfield and Bloom can make the borough a nicer place to live. Every year, Mr Lushy, alongside his team of dedicated green-fingered volunteers, tours the borough in a bid to find the blooming best gardeners in Enfield. Enfield in Bloom is an annual competition run by volunteers and sponsored by businesses including Tottenham Hotspur Football Club, whose training ground is located on the borough's northern borders in White Webbs Lane. 
Armed with a sophisticated knowledge of anything that needs soil, sun, and water to thrive, the team of volunteers and lecturers from Capel Manor College in Bullsmoor Lane inspect the candidates queuing up to take part in the competition. When people take care of their gardens, it really improves the look of the borough, Mr Lushy told the Enfield Advertiser at the launch of this year's competition at the Enfield Civic Centre in Silver Street last Wednesday. Walking down a street with nice flowers, well-maintained shrubs and lawns, everyone knows it makes a nicer place to live and work. He said the environment can be improved by doing things as simple as having window boxes or bright, colourful container plants outside your home. But with more and more young people saying they have no gardening skills, Mr Lushy explains that is why Enfield and Bloom spends time nurturing a love of growing things amongst schoolchildren. We go into primary schools, the children show us what they've grown and why they're so proud, he said. It takes quite a long time to judge in schools because each child gets so passionate about what they've done, but it's worth seeing their passion and joy. A myth he's keen to dispel is that it's only people who own their own homes who can make their gardens competition ready. A lot of our ent entrants are renters, he added. You don't need to own a garden to make an effort to make your property and garden attractive. Everyone can take pride in their area, in their environment, where they live, and we're encouraging people that if they want a nicer area, then they can take things into their own hands. To enter the competition, go to www.enfieldinbloom.org.uk. That's www.enfieldinbloom.org.uk. And now another horticultural story. Prize-winning cacti prove a real crowd-pleaser. Plant lovers have been showing off their weirdly charming wonders to green-fingered admirers. Scores of cacti more suited to a desert landscape than North London were on show at Capel Manor Gardens in Bullsmoor Lane, Enfield, for three days over the bank holiday weekend. Growers had 69 classes to enter, <coughs> excuse me, in the hope their prized plants would scoop a prize at the Lee Valley branch of the British Cactus and Succulent Society event. The society is devoted to growing desert plants, and show secretary Roger Day was delighted with the turnout. He said it went quite well, and we were very lucky with the weather. We had a lot of plants, and it was good to see a lot of children being enthusiastic about cacti. I think they like them because they're so different. The next meeting of the Society is at Capel Manor on Wednesday, June the 8th at 7.30pm. But don't go to that. Come to our AGM instead. There's a fantastic picture with this article, uh, and the title is Little Beauty, Barbara Baker with her husband's prize-winning Sulcobutia cactus. hope I pronounced that right. It's this very strange-looking thing in a pot. looks a bit like a pineapple, this sort of spherical thing with some spiky bits on top, and it's about the size of a human head, rather spiky as well. And away from the garden now, and onto the high street, two key high street stores to shut their doors. Two high street fixtures have confirmed they are to shut down. Green Pounder, a hardware store on Green Lanes in Palmer's Green, will close their doors this month after 26 years of trading. Siddhar Ozkis has run Green Pounder since 2009 and said he can no longer afford to run the shop and keep up with the competition. He said business rates and rent for the premises, £968 per month in rate, re rates and £5,000 rent each quarter, were too high for him to bear. Mr Oskis said, There is no way I can cover everything. We are just making a small living. Despite trying our best, we are in a terrible condition. This will lead any kind of business to closure. We're all trying and struggling. Plenty of people are trying to sell up and go, but you just can't walk away. It's too late for me. Even big companies are having to shut their doors. The rent and rates make sure both parties lose. If they were not so high, we would still exist. He was correct to say bigger premises businesses are leaving Palmer's Green premises, with WH Smith confirming their store on Alderman's Hill just off Green Lanes will also shut this summer. A spokesman for the company, who refused to be named, said, We can confirm that WH Smith's store in Palmer's Green will be closing in mid-July. Unfortunately, we're unable to continue to trade viably from this location. Enfield Council have been contacted for comment on the closure of the stores. A new £12 million social worker scheme. Councils in North London have been selected to pioneer a £12 million social worker training scheme. 
to mark the start of Mental Health Awareness Week, 16 local services nationwide, including Enfield Council and Barnet Council, have joined forces with the charity Think Ahead to train graduates as social workers. The scheme will see graduates given £18,000 annual bursaries to train as social workers, with Enfield and Barnet students to be among the first. All the places have now been filled. And now a double-page spread with some amazing photos of uh, motorbikes uh, and uh, and classic cars here. And the headline, A Wheelie Spectacular Show. Enfield went car crazy over the bank holiday weekend as vehicles of all shapes and sizes drew huge crowds to its annual motoring pageant. Thousands of enthusiasts, visitors and traders flocked to the three-day extravaganza on Saturday, Sunday and Monday to drool enviously at the polished chrome curbs of the classic and vintage vehicles and motorbikes. The spectacular annual pageant, the borough's 39th at Enfield Playing Fields in Great Cambridge Road, has petrol heads in automobile heaven, with an array of British saloon and sports classics, together with an American Cadillac, as well as vintage buses and military vehicles. The weather remained dry and mainly fine, enabling visitors to have a peek under the bonnets and view the many stalls selling collectibles, as well as enjoying the variety of entertainment provided. The event is organised by the Enfield and District Veteran Vehicle Trust and is a fundraiser for White Webb's Museum of Transport in White Webb's Road, Enfield. Vehicles from the museum were on display, along with cars owned by individuals and car clubs. Other attractions included a motorcycle display team, fairground rides including a big wheel and an automobile auto jumble, plus live music from 1950s US style singing group The Fabulous Polka Dots and Big Band Sounds. Next, dismay over CCG plans to stop free medicine. Disappointment has been expressed at plans to stop GPs in Enfield handing out free medicine. Monty Meth, president of the Over 50s Forum based at Millfield House, Silver Street, is concerned about Enfield Clinical Commissioning Group's idea to save money. He says GPs in 49 surgeries across the borough are being told by the CCG to stop issuing free prescriptions for medicines that can be bought in pharmacies and supermarkets. Some of these medicines no longer prescribed may include paracetamol, hay fever remedies, costing between six and ten pounds, and also eye drops and ointments costing between two and eight pounds. The forum believes the CCG is attempting to increase efficiency savings from 9.9 million to 17.1 million in this financial year, but it will affect patients who cannot afford to pay for medicine. Monty Meth said, The most disappointing thing is that the CCG says it will involve patients and the public in everything they do, but when it comes to decisions that have an effect on ordinary people, they do not ask us. This is not the way things should be done, as once again it is the poorest and most vulnerable people in the borough who will be the hardest hit. Mr. Meth believes thousands of people in the borough rely on free medicines due to being on low or non-existent incomes, and they have a right to be involved in healthcare decisions. He said Enfield residents are now rated as living in the 12th most deprived of London's 32 boroughs, and in this attempt by the Enfield NHS Clinical Commissioning Group to reduce its uh, medicines bill will mainly hurt people on income support, the unemployed on job seekers allowance, the hundreds if not thousands of elderly local people receiving pension credit, and families with children under 16. Enfield CCG has been asked for comment. And more health news, the chief executive of Enfield Clinical Commissioning Group has resigned after less than a year in the role. Paul Jenkins has stood down from the NHS CCG and will take up new assignments in other departments. Mr Jenkins, who'd been part of the group since August 2015, will be replaced by Sarah Thompson. She'll start on Monday after previously being the borough director at the Enfield Primary Care Trust until 2012. Dr Mo Abidi, the chairman, said he was delighted to welcome Miss Thompson in her new role. Sarah has demonstrable track record of commitment and success in her extensive NHS career and will be a real asset as the CCG moves into its next phase. I would like to thank Paul for leading us through a period of challenging times. During his time with us, Paul has led a number of new service developments, including the procurement of an integrated urgent care. 
And now we're about halfway through our broadcast today, and uh, I'm going to give you some what's on news and notices, starting with a rather interestingly titled uh, production which is taking place at the Millfield Theatre. And the title says, Flushed with Success, and the article reads, An all-singing, all-dancing musical titled Urine Town. Surely someone's taking the proverbial. An award-winning Broadway smash, despite its off-putting moniker, this darkly amusing satire is being staged by St Monica's Players and an Amateur Dramatic Society at Millfield Theatre in Silver Street, Edmonton, for a four-day run from Wednesday, June the 15th to Saturday, June the 18th. The plot is set in a dystopian future when, following a catastrophic ten-year drought, citizens of Cladwell are forced to pay to pee. Private loos are banned, replaced by privatised public conveniences, operated by a malevolent corporation run by a corrupt tycoon called Caldwell B. Cladwell. Those caught trying to avoid the Tinkle Tariff are banished to a mysterious place called Urin Town. But a rebel movement emerges and overthrows the tyranny, so the oppressed masses are able to relieve themselves for free again. Mixed in is a love story, as the idealist renegade leader Bobby Strong falls for the boss's beautiful daughter, who joins the revolution against her father. The show satirises the legal system, capitalism, social ir irresponsibility, populism, bureaucracy, corporate mismanagement and municipal politics, as well as parodying mu musical theatre itself. You're in town is unique, said director Warren McWilliams. With so many modern musicals being lightweight and fluffy, it's great to have something with a bit of substance to it. Its Brechtian tones have the audience questioning who's right and who's wrong, and what the consequences of our actions are. But rather cleverly, you're in town managed to do it while you sit tapping your feet to music in fits of laughter. And a reminder that uh, you're in town by the uh, St. Monica's players will be at the Millfield Theatre from Wednesday, June the 15th, to Saturday, June the 18th. And hopefully you don't want to pop off for a tinkle just yet. We've got some more uh, What's On notices coming up. Starting with audio tours at the Whitechapel Gallery. The Whitechapel Gallery has confirmed the next three dates for audio-described tours, which will focus on a new major exhibition by the abstract artist Mary Heilman. The tours are free, as is entrance to the gallery and they'll take place on Wednesday the 8th, 15th of June at 11.30, Saturday the 16th of July at 1 o'clock, and Wednesday the 3rd of August at 11.30. To book your free place, contact the Whitechapel Gallery by email or phone. Email them at access at whitechapelgallery.org, access at whitechapelgallery, all one word, dot org, or phone 020 7522 7888. And more audio tours now, this time at Tate Britain. On Monday the 20th of June from 2 until 4pm, a practical workshop for blind and partially sighted participants will provide the opportunity to gain a deeper understanding of Anwar Shems's work and his processes. Using a range of tactile drawing and printing techniques, the session will explore the themes used by the artist, from his use of calligraphy and architecture to his interest in the relationship between texture and form. There are limited places, they say, so book early to avoid disappointment. You can contact Anna Murray, the assistant curator at the Tate, on Anna.Murray, that's Anna, A-N-N-A, dot Murray, M-U-R-R-A-Y, Anna.Murray, at Tate.org.uk. Or call Anna on 020-7887-8888. That's 020 7887 and a bit further ahead now, a notice from Metro Blind Sport and the Thomas Pocklington Trust about a ladies' football event in Southgate for blind and visually impaired sports people, run by coaches from Tottenham Hotspur. And it'll take place on Saturday the 16th of July from 1 until 4pm at Barnet and Southgate College, the Southgate Campus, High Street Southgate, London N14 6BS and you'll be met at Southgate Station, which is on the Piccadilly Line, a short walking distance from the college, and you can meet there at 12.30. To register and book your place, contact Odette Batterell at the Thomas Pocklington Trust on 07974 578 637. That's Odette Batterell at the Thomas Pocklington Trust on 07974 578 637. Or you can email her at Odette B, that's O-D-E-B, 
T-T-E-B, Odette B, at pocklington-trust.org.uk. Odette B, at pocklington-trust.org.uk. And now back to uh, our news. And five wait sentencing over a plot to free prisoner from van. An Enfield man who was part of a gang involved in a foiled at- plot to spring a dangerous criminal from prison v- a prison van is facing a lengthy jail term after being found guilty by a jury. Aaron Heiser, aged 25 of Kettering Road, Enfield Wash, was one of the five-strong team which Is It Aaron assembled to ambush the van, taking him from Wormwood Scrubs Prison to Woodgreen Crown Court, where he was to be sentenced on firearms-related charges on the 11th of December last year. But police had been tipped off and were lying in wait, having planted a listening device in one of the vehicles in which three of the gang members were parked up to close to the court. As armed officers swooped on their vehicles to thwart the attempted breakout, one of the gang, Jermaine Baker, aged 28 from Tottenham, was shot dead by a police firearms officer. His death is the subject of an investigation by the Independent Police Complaints Commission. Heiser, the only member of the gang to deny charges of conspiring in the escape plot, was convicted at Woolwich Crown Court last Tuesday. He was acquitted of possession of an imitation firearm. A second conspirator, is it Aaron's cousin, Oscan Aaron, aged 31, of Wood Green, had denied the same charges but changed his plea and pleaded guilty at Woolwich Crown Court on May the 18th. Is it Aaron, aged 32, and two other members of the gang, Nathan Mason, aged 30, of South Tottenham, and Goke Sogukali, aged 19, of Tottenham, pleaded guilty to the same offences on February the 29th. They'll be sentenced at a later date. The gang hatched the plot to spring Is It Aaron from the prison van, as he was due for sentencing, having earlier pleaded guilty to several offences after being stopped on a stolen motorbike in an intelligence-led police operation in Stamford Hill in October last year. Aaron had loaded a pistol in a bag, and police recovered a loaded Scorpion submachine gun in a bag dropped nearby. His sentencing for these firearms-related charges went ahead after the failed plot to free him, and he was jailed for 14 years on the 11th of December, along with an accomplice, Amoyas Jimamfi, aged 29. Detective Superintendent Tom Manson from the Metropolitan Police's Serious and Organised Crime Command said the attempt to free Aaron Izzett was a bold, well-planned and carefully thought-out conspiracy, bearing all the hallmarks of a professional crime. And now news about the night tube. MP voices concerns over safety on the night tube. Service will only benefit core zones. And there's a picture of the MP for Edmonton, Kate Ossimore. The MP for Edmonton is concerned a 24-hour tube will result in less staff being available to protect passenger safety. MP Kate Ossimore is sceptical about plans to commence a night tube on the Central and Victoria lines on August the 19th, which were announced by the new Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, last week. The service will run all night on Fridays and Saturdays, and the Piccadilly, Jubilee and Northern lines will follow later in the autumn. The Piccadilly line will run from Cockfosters to Arnos Grove on 20, for 24 hours on those days. The plans were due to start last September, but were delayed after union members went on strike over the service, along with issues about their pay and conditions. Miss Ossimore believes the tube will only benefit people who live close to the main rail lines. She said the fact does remain, however, that this will only be of concrete benefit to those who live in the core zones, with access to the main lines. I'm also concerned over passenger security at stations. Will there be an increase in visible staff working on the platforms and ticket barriers at night? Will the ticket offices that had been closed down under former Mayor Boris Johnson's administration be reopened? Joanne McCartney, Labour London Assembly member for Enfield and Haringey, also warned safety and noise disturbance will also have to be considered. She said the night tube will be an excellent expansion of London's transport network and great news for the nighttime economy, but TfL have to introduce it in a safe and sympathetic way. And the next news story. Boy 2 hurt in road accident. A toddler has been taken to hospital after being in collision with a car. 
The two-year-old boy was treated at the scene in 4th Street, Edmonton, for his injuries following the accident shortly after 7 o'clock on Bank Holiday Monday. The extent of the injuries has not been confirmed. London Ambulance Service said, We were called at 7.09pm on the 30th of May to reports of a road traffic collision involving a vehicle and a pedestrian near 4th Street, Edmonton. We sent an ambulance crew, an incident response officer, and a single responder by car, and London's air ambulance. The first of our medics arrived at the scene within five minutes. We treated a child at the scene for a head injury and took him to hospital. Next, residents given Commons chance to press case for lorries diversion. Safety campaigners are meeting the Secretary of State for Transport to renew calls for a road to divert M25 bound lorries away from an accident black spot. Patrick McLaughlin has agreed to meet campaigners at the House of Commons on Monday, June the 27th. Mr McLaughlin visited Bullsmore Lane last April, just before the 2015 general election, to hear residents' concerns about the volume of lorries on the road. In December, a pedestrian died after he was involved in a collision with a lorry in Bullsmore Lane. Last month, Enfield North MP Joan Ryan pressed Mr McLaughlin in the Commons about his pre-election pledge to prioritise building a new access road to the M25 in a bid to divert lorries from the residential area. The Labour MP said as Mr McLaughlin had visited Bullsmore Lane to see for himself, he knows that it is being used as a slip road off the M25. It is a residential area with a very serious accident record as a route to central London. She asked him to meet residents' representatives to help find a solution. Mr McLaughlin said there does seem to be some confusion over whether this is a matter for Transport for London or for Highways England. That is no answer to the people who are suffering from the problems. It is a very difficult area to deal with because all of the residential implications, but we will have that meeting. Save Bullsmore Lane campaigner Rosemary Mehmet, who will be at the meeting, said Mr McLaughlin counted the amount of traffic when he visited the site last year. He, s he said he could see what the problem was, she said. He counted traffic last year. She said that campaigners would be telling Mr McLaughlin that one death was too many and wanted to see an access road between Mollison Avenue and Bullsmore Lane. She said it has a knock-on effect all through the borough. As I'm looking out of the window now, the traffic is at a standstill. Another campaigner, Norman Bennett, who will also be at the meeting, raised concerns about safety in the 1970s. The first section of the M25 between South Mims and Potter's Bar was opened in 1975. And more about another campaign group now, and uh, the headline, Developers Under Fire for Rejecting Ecological Survey. An MP says that pleas for an ecological study on a controversial Greenbelt site have been snubbed. Joan Ryan, the MP for Enfield North, had backed demands for campaigners to be allowed to carry out a biodiversity survey on fields that developers want to build on. But Fairview New Homes, who manage the site off Enfield Road and Cotswolds Way in Oakwood, have turned down their request that the Enfield Road Watch should be allowed to conduct the study. Such surveys help give local authorities a bigger picture of the issues before them when they decide whether planning applications should be backed or thrown out. Fairview managed the site on behalf of owners the Church of England's Diocese of London. Earlier this year, the company ditched plans for 300 homes, a new college and school on the site. Miss Ryan said, Fairview say they want to be open and transparent and they have the opportunity to do both here and they're not taking it. We all have a vested interest in protecting Greenbelt open space. There has to be a very good, special case if Greenbelt land is to be built on. The onus is on Fairview to make that case, and they're not making that case, and we are being obstructive towards residents who are trying to make a specialist case for not building on the Greenbelt. Enfield Roadwatch say the fields are rich with various plants and an abundance of wildlife, which has included red kites and bats. Miss Ryan said the residents are going to do this are going to this trouble because they care about the environment. Ian D'Souza, chairman of Enfield Road Watch, criticised Fairview, saying, Where is their community spirit and what are they trying to hide? He said that a letter received from Fairview indicated several required surveys had already been carried out. 
The advertiser contacted Fairview for comment on Tuesday, but it did not respond by the time we went to press. Warm tributes for pioneering GP Iris. A former Edmonton GP who was interned by the Japanese during World War II before becoming the first woman head of the casualty department of a central London hospital has died aged 91. Dr Iris Crass was born in Hong Kong where her father worked for a finance company and her mother was an English teacher at a boys' prep school. Her family tried to flee at the beginning of the war, but their ship was intercepted by the Japanese Navy at Manila, and she was interned in the Philippines for the rest of the war. Her mother and brother were separated from Iris and her sister. The girls were aged just 11 and 9 at the time. Her story was included in the book Stolen Childhood, the untold story of the children interned by the Japanese. The interned children were taught by other internees, and after the war Iris went to grammar school in Lincolnshire. She secured a place at St Thomas's Hospital in central London, where she was one of the few women training to be a doctor. Her friend, Dr June Keat, said she was very proud of being the first woman head of the casualty department at St Thomas's. She later worked for the civil service in a specialist post and finally decided to spend the rest of her career as a very well-loved GP in Edmonton. She worked as a GP at the Dover House Surgery in Bolton Road, Edmonton, and was an avid reader of alternative interpretations of Shakespeare. Dr. Keat added that she was also interested in antique ceramics and learned how to restore them. She was a keen traveller in the UK and abroad. Dr. Crass was also an active member of the Enfield and District Branch of the of Soroptimist International and was involved in the club's work to help women and girls in the UK and support girls in India and Africa get access to education. Her funeral service will be held on Tuesday the 21st of June at Grange Park Methodist Church in Old Park Ridings at 11.30am. Adventurers tackle some big obstacles for charity. Seven mothers and one father with no adventuring experience have completed a gruelling obstacle course for charity. They took part in the Nuclear Race's seven-kilometre obstacle race in Brentwood, Essex, in aid of the North London Hospice. The team completed the course together, which included jumping off platforms into water, negotiating a death slide and wading through several areas of waist-deep mud and water. One of the mothers, Helen Constantinou, said all team members came out bruised and battered, but were glad to support the charity as they managed to raise £2,000, more than double their original target. The 48-year-old from Oakwood said, I was chatting to friends at the school gates and said I wanted to do something for charity, something that would push me to the extremes. A few said they wanted to get involved and a few became a few, a few extra. We've never done anything like this before, but courses like this are quite fashionable. It wasn't a race. We all wanted to complete it safely and we did. I'm covered in bruises still, but I'm exhilarated and feel a great sense of achievement. A few obstacles were straightforward, but there were things like climbing the fireman's pole or jumping into the water that took a lot of guts. Miss Constantino is ladies' vice-captain at Bush, Bush Hill Park Golf Club, with the club's chosen charity this year being the hospice. And now a fantastic photo here of a brass band um, parading down the street with some great big instruments in the front. I'm not sure what they are. Um, and the headline, Brass Band Beat the Opposition. London's oldest brass band has taken home the gold in a national contest held at the weekend. Enfield Brass Band won first prize in their category at three of the villages uh, in the annual contest that was held in Lancashire. Band secretary and brass trombone player Alex Gould said the 26-piece band had worked hard to be able to enjoy the competition. He added that the villages involved in the contest loved to see that their bands perform through their streets. Mr Gould said, People are thrilled it's not a dying art. The sound of a band playing at full pelt, we can shake the windows. It's an amazing sound to hear. The contest is often described as the FA Cup of the brass band world, as bands all compete against each other to wow the crowds and impress the judges with their performances. And a bit about Volunteers Week, which is this week, and a big thank you to all our uh, ETN volunteers who help us um, keep our show on the road and bring you uh, a recording every week. And uh, the article says, Your chance to volunteer and be a real-life hero. 
Could you run faster than a speeding bullet, move mountains, or even see the tiniest speck traveling from Earth? To space, of course not, because unlike the fictional superheroes in Hollywood blockbusters, volunteers in Enfield are real life heroes, and they form a mighty battalion with the power to change lives. Councillor Yasmin Brett, Enfield Council's cabinet member for community organisations and culture, says an estimated one hundred thousand heroes already give up their free time to help others. Every day, volunteers are doing something that makes a difference. It can be helping in a charity shop, coaching young people at a sports club. Hearing young people read at a school, visiting an older person, offering to help at a food bank, becoming a friend of the libraries and parks, sharing an interest to inspire others. We have a great volunteering tradition in Enfield, and want even more people to give their free time to really transform the lives of people in genuine need of help and assistance. Here are a few reasons to volunteer: to learn new skills and improve your job prospects. It's a good way to meet people and make friends. It can promote personal growth and development. It strengthens the local neighbourhood. You will be able to learn about how charities work and their area of expertise. You'll get the chance to give something back to those in need. It increases civic pride and responsibility. There are opportunities to travel overseas with international programmes, and it's really good fun. To find out how to volunteer, visit enfield.gov.uk. And now we come to the sports news. And、uh, first, some cricket、uh, news. Southgate's batting falters as they're beaten by Ealing. Southgate struggled with the bat as they slumped to a six-wicket wicket defeat at home to Ealing in the Premier Division of the Middlesex County Cricket League on Saturday. The hosts had posted substantial totals in their previous two matches, but they found life tough on this occasion as wickets fell at regular intervals throughout their innings. Arriving at the crease with the score on 52 for five, Rashid Mulalazad provided some real resistance with an excellent unbeaten 54 runs, but no one else was able to make a major con- contribution as Southgate were dismissed for 123. Chris Chris Glasper four for 31 missed,、uh, sorry, and Ollie Wilkin three for 23 were the most successful bowlers. A dramatic start to the visitors' reply saw them slump to seven for three, with Mukesh Bat two for twenty-two from ten overs coming to the fore. But that was as good as it got for Southgate, as Milo Wilkin, sixty-two not out, and Hugh Jones, thirty-nine, shared in a decisive stand of ninety-eight for the fourth wicket, ending any doubt over the result as Ealing eased to one hundred and twenty-seven for four. Elsewhere, Enfield continued their fine start to the season in Division Two by securing a nine-wicket win at home to Indian Jim Carner. Having been put into the bat, the visitors struggled from the start of their innings, but it was the introduction of Lee Robertson to the attack that proved to be their undoing, as he took five for four to spark a dramatic collapse, which saw the last five wickets fall for the addition of just four runs, and they were dismissed for eighty-eight. Enfield lost the informed Jack Plum in the early stages of their reply, but they suffered no further alarms as Neville Talbot smashed to an unbeaten 56 to help them race to 89 for one in just 12 overs. There was disappointment from Winchmore Hill, though, as their perfect record in Division Three came to an end with a six-wicket six wicket defeat at North London. Hill, who had won their first three matches, could only post a total of 136 batting first, with Tom Wakeford taking three for 33. And Will Lake then struck an unbeaten 47 as North London eased to 137 for four in reply. Southgate go to North Middlesex on Saturday, while Enfield visit Finchley and Winchmore Hill host Besborough. And now some、uh, excellent news for our local rugby team:、uh, a double success for Saracens, and the headline "Saris do the double." Saracens' fantastic season came to a fittingly successful conclusion on Saturday, as they held off a determined second-half fight back to beat Exeter 28-20 at, tw- at Twickenham to retain their Aviva Premiership title and complete a memorable league and European double. Saris had been crowned champions of Europe for the first time in their history two weeks earlier, and they went into the match looking to become the first English team for 14 years to win both major trophies in the same season. And the reigning champions got off to a great start in their bid to achieve this, as they raced into a 23-6 lead by the interval following a dominant first-half display. 
Duncan Taylor and Chris Wiles scored tries to help them move into such a strong position, with Owen Farrell converting both of them and also kicking three penalties. However, Exeter came storming back in the second period, and tries from Jack Yindel and Jack Noel saw them close to within three points. Saris were not to be denied, though, and their victory was secured when Alex Good touched down within four minutes remaining, and the crowd and were crowned champions for the third time in six years. We all remember what it felt like losing two finals in a row two years ago, said director of Mug- rugby Mark McCall. Losing the premiership final in the l- in the last second of extra time was painful, the hardest it gets. But to have two seasons, have the two seasons we've just had, winning it last season and getting to the European Championship Cup semi final, and then going on one better this year is special. We played thirty three matches this season and only lost four, and that's not a bad record. We don't pick and choose, we get up for every match. The age profile of the team is good, everyone is signed up for the next two or three seasons, and the spine of the team is there. But the Premiership is getting stronger and stronger. Exeter will come back harder, so we'll have to stay hungry and stay motivated and keep pushing ourselves on. McCall added, the club's problem seven years ago was that they chopped and changed as players and staff came and went. Now it's not only just about the guys that have come through the academy, the people who've signed from elsewhere have stayed for a long period of time. With that continuity comes relationships, and with that comes togetherness. That has been built over a seven-year period, and we can see the rewards. So well done to Saracens, our local rugby team, and their double success. And we've reached the end of our programme this week. Thank you for listening. And I'm sorry you've only been listening to me um, for the last 60 minutes or so. Uh, So it's goodbye from me. Please remember to turn over the address label in your postal packet, put the memory, memory stick into the packet and return it to us as soon as possible in readiness for the next edition. Don't forget you can call Diane de Jersey regarding any help you may require in connection with the Enfield Talking newspaper. And you can call Diane on 020 8805 6578. Don't forget a last reminder about our AGM on Wednesday the 8th of June at St Andrew's Parish Centre in Enfield Town. Uh, do come along and support the charity. Coming up next, the latest news and information for the Greater London area from InfoSound. The Enfield Talking newspaper will be with you again in one week's time.